the transformed supernatural mind. We all know the mind's a battlefield. You know that because you fight it almost every day. Never are we afraid to say, you know, there's trouble ahead. Ephesians 4 verse 22 says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Romans 12 verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, since last July uh, 27th, I've been speaking a lot because the Lord impressed me heavily to speak on supernatural. Supernatural things, supernatural life, supernatural ways, supernatural battles. So where does this transformation begin? It begins in the mind. It's the way you think. It's, it's what you're dealing with every day. The mind of the believer. Let's talk for a moment about that. In some Christian circles, the mind has been minimized to the degree that it's that you're not supposed to use your mind. You're just supposed to follow what you've learned. You're not supposed to have any critical thinking about anything. And it's created a mindless gospel that just, it's almost like a cult. It, it's cultic worship because we can't say this, we can't do this. It's the law. And Paul said we're set free from that. The challenge for each of us is to give ourselves purposefully and completely to the message of the full gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us access to his supernatural lifestyle. He said, do what I do. Go where I go. Say what I say. You can be the carrier of God's glory in this community. You can see your life as a carrier of who God is and who Jesus is in you. You know, a lot of people read, read the Bible and, and they get the information and they retain it. And that logos gets stored up inside. But the logos is only a seed. It's a seed for what God wants to harvest through the rhema. So the Logos is wonderful. I know a lot of people who can quote tons of Scripture, but they don't translate that into a harvest in the kingdom of God. Your spirit and your imagination starts building around what you know as the Logos. Starts building around this Word of God. You become a doer of the Word, not a hearer only. A lot of Christians have information from the Word. But God wants the seed of the Word to be illuminated by revelation. He wants to reveal to you who He is, what His Spirit is about in you. Once the Word becomes revelation or rhema word, it becomes the substance for a person to step out of the shell of only holding the Word and become the Word, like Jesus did. You say, ooh, that's heretical. He was the Word, the living Word. Did Jesus not say... The things that I do, you shall do. And because there's more of you, even greater things than I do shall you do. Because I send the Holy Spirit to you. And this is the part where your imagination, spiritual imagination, comes into play. Our spiritual eyes and our imagination plays a big part when it comes to the miraculous. We have to see what others don't see. We have to understand through the Holy Spirit's revelation what they don't understand. If you want to see great miracles, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to create new images in your mind. You need to, to allow Him to create in you that that the other part of the world can't see. Sometimes even in Christian circles. By His stripes we're healed. When we know that and we have pain, we start speaking that. I've been telling you that. It's, it's happened to me over the last 10, 15 years when I've caught this revelation. Every time that pain comes, I say, I'm healed in Jesus' name. By the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. That pain cannot stay. It has to go. I speak it and I speak it. And Carol told me the other day, she'd been doing that about her knee or something. Is it your knee? Her knee was hurting. She kept saying, I'm, I'm saying that. By 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes, I am healed. I, will not, I do not absorb this pain any longer. It will not stay with me. I will do what I'm supposed to do and it will go away. Finally, the meaning of the word becomes real in your life. It becomes reality. If you want to see great miracles, you need to allow the Holy Spirit to create those new images in your mind. Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things other people don't see. But as a person of God, I see it through my faith. So I believe 
the imagination comes from hope. And the more it's used, the more your faith is increased. It's like taking a picture uh, on a highway uh, with a, a, like, you remember the Polaroid camera? You take it with the Polaroid camera, uh, old Polaroid, and you watch as it develops. You ever, you ever done that? How many ever did that? You watch it develop, yeah? yeah? You young people don't know because everything's digital now, but we used to have to wait on stuff. There was a time when we had to actually wait. You believe that? It wasn't instant. I know that's hard for some of you to believe. But that picture would develop. So what you do is you take a faith picture with your faith Polaroid camera because you know that you're taking a picture down that highway and as it appears, the thing that you couldn't see before, that car coming toward you, it appears in that picture because by faith you've seen it. It's the same way with any kind of disease or trouble or uh, occupancy of the enemy in your life when he tries to take over, tries to come and, and uh, you gotta, when he knocks on your door, you say, hey, hey, I don't live here anymore. You've got to take it up with the landlord. His name is Jesus. I don't own this anymore. It's not mine. This, this old body, I used to own it, but I don't anymore. So if, if, if you're trying to inflict pain on me, take it up with the landlord. You have to go through him first. He's the one who's in control here. See, an appetite for the supernatural, for heaven to become real on earth, is absolutely normal for the person who is a true believer. I mean, it, is, it should be normal in your life, but it's not common in today's church yet. It's just not. Faith gives you the power to act upon what you're believing for and see it come to pass as you decree it to be so. I believe God is changing the way Christians are thinking about so-called impossible things. I'm going to tell you something. The church better step up and grab hold of this because there are churches in the third world countries where you saw those little children receiving those boxes. There are churches all over the third world in our world who are seeing miracles that are astounding every single day because they have not been taught how not to believe. See, our churches have taught us how not to believe God. <laughs> well, God used to do it, but He doesn't do it anymore. He was passed away with the apostles. It was a different day then. It was a different... God didn't mean that. When He said that uh, all things are possible to them that believe, He meant someday in heaven it'll all be possible. No, no, He didn't. He meant here on earth. Did Jesus not pray, heaven on earth, let it be here as it is there. Well, if we believe that could happen, which as believers, we should. God changing things. See, it's all built in us. This is a revolutionary approach to Christian living, though, in most churches. If you were to stand up in most churches today and say, God can do a miracle in your life, they'd throw you out. You can't preach that here. That's not what we believe. Well, you can come here and believe that. It's okay. Because we're going we're gonna to preach it. We're going to believe it. Because I, I'm going to tell you something. I believe written in the spiritual DNA of every believer, whether you know it or not, is this appetite to see God perform the impossible. It's, it's in you. It's, it's only tamped down by the words that some unbelieving pastor or preacher might have said to you somewhere along the way. I've said this before. I've said, you know, it's easy to preach salvation because there's no physical evidence of that. So we call everybody to come for salvation. Everybody comes and prays. It's harder to preach healing because there's physical evidence that has to follow. Now, we had a guy walk on a Thursday night about a month ago, walk out of a chair right back here and come down. At the end of a sermon, I preached about supernatural healing. Stood there with a prosthesis from his knee down. And he said, I believe I've never seen him again. He said, I'm believing for restoration of my leg. I said, now, folks, that's miraculous believing. I haven't seen him. I don't know who he is. I don't know his name. But I believe one day he's going to come back in these doors. And he's going to say, you remember the night that I stood there and we prayed together and we believed together and you anointed me with oil and we believed for a leg? I believe that God will do that. Amen. Now, that may be heretical in some churches. But it was not heretical to Jesus. Blind eyes open. Limbs healed. Lame walked. Resurrected from the tomb, Lazarus came forth. It's built in us to want that, to, to have that, to experience this. The Holy Spirit, the very Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And we can no longer be content just to operate on five senses. There has to be more. 
If we live only by five senses, then we're no different than the rest of the world. Anything less than miraculous is abnormal and unfulfilling to the true believer. Nothing satisfies the heart of the Christian, true Christian, like seeing earth's impossibilities bow to the name of Jesus Christ. This is why we preach this. Bad teaching and disappointments and not being willing to wait have robbed us of the reality of God's power and miracles. Listen, these are the last days, folks. If we don't do it now, there will never be another chance. It's time to see Jesus actively moving through the streets of Branson, Missouri. I, I, I think we have to redefine normal. What's been normal is not normal today. What's been okay in the church can't continue to be okay in the church. Church world today is not connected enough to the truth of the supernatural power of God. We want status quo. We want to roll along and say that we're all okay. But the true Christian life begins with a realization that we were put here to do the will of God just as Jesus was on this earth. And I believe the will of God is simpler and plainer and more supernatural than we have thought. It's just that we have been conditioned to not believe it. In what's known as the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said this, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. So the will of God is simply this, on earth as it is in heaven. Did he not say that? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're praying for the king's dominion to be realized here. The king's dominion is in the king's domain. When we make this our mission, people are set free. Bodies are healed. Darkness lifts from people's lives. Businesses grow and succeed and, and relationships are restored and people reconnect with God's purpose and things begin to change in people's lives, in their marriages, in their financial situations, in their children's lives. We begin to see things happen. Churches grow. Cities feel like there's a power of God that's moving across a community. And I believe we can take a city for Christ and we can pray it under the authority of the Holy Spirit of God. Satan's rule pushed back in every way imaginable. This is what supernatural is. Extraordinary. Supernatural things begin to happen on such a regular basis like stepping into the page of a novel about heaven because heaven has become a part of earth. Not some made up lifestyle. This is what Jesus called for. We were created for this. One of the major functions of supernatural living is to offer irrevocable, Im immutable, absolute proof that Jesus Christ is alive today. Jesus Christ is alive today. How do we know? Because miracles still happen. You want to prove to the world that Jesus is alive? Let miracles continue to happen around them. Let them see the power of God. Not some show of the power of God, but a reality that comes into their life. It's a lifestyle for which we were created. The Apostle Paul said, let's read it again, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world. Now, here's what he's talking about. It says, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. So where's the problem? The problem is in the mind. Amen. Don't be conformed to the world. So what's he talking about? Well, if you put the reference point down, it's the mind. Do not let your mind be conformed to the mind of the world. He goes on over in Philippians to say, let this mind that is in Christ Jesus be also in you. So he was a lot about the mind. And, and what we have to understand is that the world's mind wants to control us. Every time you turn on the television, every time you go to the internet, it's the world's mind that's speaking to you in general. And the world wants to control your thoughts. The world wants to control your words. The world wants to control your present, your future, and your past. And they want to change it into their image, their conformity. But Paul says, by the renewing of your mind, be transformed so that you can do the good and pleasing will of God. See, the will of God's clear. Our job is to demonstrate that the reality of heaven exists here on earth, that we can actually live in that, that we can actually see God at work. We're not just to be people who say the right things about God or even believe the right things about God. We're people who are supposed to put the will of God on display like Jesus did. You say, boy, that's radical. Yeah, he was too. He shook people up. See, we have this idea that everybody loved Jesus. Everybody accepted him. No, they crucified him. Remember? They called him a heretic. They called him crazy. They called him a lunatic. 
Healing and deliverance and restoration give people a concrete demonstration of who God is. When people are delivered by the power of God, set free by the power of God, it changes everything in their life. So God gave us some instructions. In essence, he said, go heal the sick, preach the gospel, the good news, demonstrate who I am, tell people what I'm like, extend my kingdom into this earth. That's what he told those 12 men and those 500 who watched him ascend. But too few of us today follow those precise instructions because we're all about what we want to tell people. I want to tell them what I know. No, let's tell them what he knows. Let's, I want to tell them who I am. No, let's tell them who he is. Let's change the script a little bit. We become enamored of our talents and our spiritual giftings. And so we want to show people what we can do. We start thinking we can direct our own course and we've got our own road and our own path and we'll do it this way and people will follow me. No, no, no. We're well-intentioned and I know that. There are a lot of well-intentioned people out there who become self-appointed in our commission and they fail. There may be a lot of people gathered around them, but they still fail because they're not promoting who he is. I don't think it's possible to prove the will of God on earth unless we're completely plugged in to who God is and to the primary mission. Listen, there's no commission without submission to the Father's mission. I said there's no commission without submission to the Father's mission. That's the mission, folks. Primary mission, we saw it in the life of Jesus. That's who it is. 1 John 3, 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that He might destroy the works of the devil. Works of the devil. What are those? Well, it's what you see in the movies. It's what you see on a lot of television programs. It's what you'll find in, in all kinds of paraphernalia in the world. You see, to destroy the works of the devil, that was Adam and Eve's assignment. Do you know that? Because that battle had been going on long before they ever got here. It was the disciples' assignment. It was Jesus' assignment. He gave it to the disciples. And then they gave it to us as, as they continued to promote the work of God. It's our assignment as well. To destroy the works of the devil. God didn't save you to simply rescue you and run you to heaven. Zip you up. Some supernatural helicopter. His purpose was bigger, more stunning than that. He commissioned you to demonstrate the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. Transforming this, this planet, this, this sour, ugly, hell-filled planet with a radiant and saturated supernatural power of His Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. And if we miss that mission, then we are not commissioned because we've not submitted to the Father's mission. When we do the will of God, we bring the kingdom reality crashing into the works of the devil. You see, I, I have a dream. I'm not going to give that one. Okay, I know you're thinking that. But I have a dream that one day the hospitals in Branson, Missouri will have no people in them. One day the clinics will be empty. Why? Because the commission and the submission created by the Father's will, that there are so many people connected to the supernatural that it empties the hospitals, that the bars go closed, no business, that, that things change in such a radical way that heaven actually comes to earth. And when that happens, everything changes. And we're the bridge. We're the connector. And if we don't do our job, that can never happen. We're the ones who have to assert the dominion of God in the earth. I'm tired of talking about a power and never seeing it. I'm t and, and I know young people today, uh, we talk about, they go to church and they hear about power, but they've never seen it. I want to see it in action. The purpose of the kingdom power is to invade society at its greatest places of need. The places that need God most. We... we, we bring it into the church, and all of us go, yay, power of God's here today, presence of God's here today, hallelujah. And then we walk out, and nothing happens. Why? Because we're not living a supernatural life, because a supernatural life will create division and, and, and trouble in the world. It'll shake things up. A supernatural person is going to create some enemies along the way. It's difficult to be a Christian and carry the Great Commission without offering proof that the kingdom actually works. And that's where we sit today. We're like the vacuum cleaner salesman who goes to the door, knocks on the door, and throws dirt on your rug. 
And then you say, hey, you messed up my rug. He said, yeah, I know. I got the greatest vacuum cleaner you've ever seen. And you say, well, come on in here and show me. No, no, I, I can't show you. But here's my card. And if you ever want to buy one, I've got one. Come on over to the store. Because it really does work. Really. You know, my floor is dirty. You're just telling me some story. I'm not interested. You see, God's power, presence, authority, deliverance, healing, and victory and salvation has to be on the street. It's got to be somewhere else than here. Here's fine. But what about out there? What about in those hard places? What about those places where, where Jesus never shows up unless we do? What about those places? See, instead of demonstrating the power of God and carrying with us this authority that we know we have because we feel it in here, we just kind of become milk toast as we go out. Oh, we're powerful in here. All God's believers together. We, we can fight the world and we're going to win the battle. And then we go out there and the first time somebody gives off a 12-word cuss string, we go, hmm, that's really terrible. And we walk away. First time somebody has real sickness or real trouble or somebody faints in a store, there's a heart attack that happens. What do we do? Call 911. Wait, wait, wait. What about this? In the name of Jesus, you rise and stand on your feet and you're healed. What about ha that happening in the place of our society? Which are we? Are we regular folks who come to church and do our thing or are we supernatural? I've been telling you since last Jul July, almost a year now. You are supernatural. But you have to embrace it. It's a good time to ask yourself. You know, when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee, he lived in constant confrontation and conflict with the world around him because he was delivering the kingdom to the world. And the world is not like the kingdom message. They like their message, which is the wrong kingdom. It's another kingdom. And their message is totally opposite to the kingdom message that you have. So are you living in conflict and confrontation with the world around you? doesn't mean you've got to be belligerent and nasty. I mean, I, I don't like it when people beat me over the head with Scripture. You know, brother, are you saved? Let me tell you, you're going to hell unless you... Wait, hold on, hold on. I don't need, I don't, I don't need your condemnation. And you can't convict me because that's the Holy Spirit's job. So my heart will condemn me when I'm wrong as long as I hear the blessing of the Word. Jesus said, I don't come to condemn you. I come to save you. I come to lift you up. You know, are you bringing the reality of heaven? This is the question. Am I bringing the reality of heaven to those I have contact with every day? How is your life contradicting the way life works for most people in this community? How is your life so different that they see you and they wonder, what is it about that person? I don't understand a renewed supernatural mind sees things the way God sees them, perceives them the way God perceives them, and the renewed mind has faith for salvation and healing and victory and deliverance and brings joy where there was sadness, brings strength where there was weakness, creates explosive creativity and the world-changing ideas and inventions where there were none. God, you know, we say it sometimes, witty inventions, things that we, we ask for God to send those to us. There's a world filled with the need for what you have because you are supernatural. You may not know what you're about to say. I've said this before. I'll be in a counseling session with someone. We're sitting in there and we're talking and, and something comes out of me and I give them an answer that I don't even know. And I, I walk out of that room sometimes going, where did that come from? It had to be the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know what I was telling them. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you words to say and the way to think that you have never thought of before. I mean, I've seen it happen over and over and over again. It's, it's a matter of connectivity and saying, God, you've got to help me here because I don't have the answers. And he does. And then you walk away going, wow, how'd that happen? Well, I know how that happened because God will remind me. Kingdom of God to be expressed on earth as it is in heaven. Now, there's a lot of obstacles. So let's talk about this and give me a few more minutes here. If you don't give them to me, I'm going to take them anyway. <laughs> See, Jesus got what I deserve so I could get what he deserved. I said, Jesus got what I deserve, so I could get what he deserved. I heard a story of a European family who, uh, there were six of them, four kids and mom and dad, and 
they had saved up enough money to come to the United States, and they they were very careful with their money, and so they they got cheese and crackers and some other things, and they it was a three week old sailing ship, three weeks, but they were coming to the United States. So they saved up the money, they bought the tickets, got on the ship that day, and for for two weeks and six days they ate cheese and crackers and whatever they had carefully put together while they were listening to the people headed for the banquet room as they went down the hallway every morning and noon and evening. So on the last evening, the father had quietly and carefully saved up enough to pay the last meal before they got to the United States. He goes to the captain and he says to the captain, how much does it cost for me and our four, my wife and our four children to eat in the, in the banquet table? And the captain said, what do you mean? He said, I mean, how much would it cost for the six of us to eat with you in the banquet room tonight? And the captain was kind of flabbergasted. And he said, what, um, you don't know that your ticket paid for the banquet every day, all three meals? You see, I think Christians live a lot like that. We don't understand what Jesus did when he paid the cost, when he bought our ticket. We don't understand that everything is included. It is not partial. It is complete. And so what we have to understand and what we have to do is take hold of all the things that Jesus paid for, all the things that he said. See, we don't know who we are. I think the problem is with our identity. The very first temptation of the Bible was not to partake of the forbidden fruit. Did you know that? It was to question what God said. That was the first temptation. Hath God said, it says here in Genesis 3, 1, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, the question was the temptation to knock down who you were. The devil did the same thing when he tempted Jesus. He said, if you are the son of God, so the devil will come to you very subtly, not tempting you to go rob a bank, but tempting you not to believe that what God says you are is who you are. See, you are supernatural. God knows it, and the devil knows it. And the devil doesn't want you to know it. So he tries to keep it from you. So he wants you to doubt your identity, just as he did to Adam and Eve, just as he did to Jesus. If he can get you to doubt your identity, you know, 99, then, then you won't, uh, then you won't, be able to grab hold of all that God's done. 95% of all the counseling in Christian churches today is dealing with helping people stop questioning what God has said about them. I've failed. I'm horrible. I'm a terrible sinner. No one can love me. You don't know what I've done. And as they spill all the stuff in their life, you see over and over again, they don't realize what Jesus paid for. They don't realize who they are. They don't realize what God has done in their lives and how he has changed them from who they were. They're still stuck in that. Listen, I know who we are. We're the people God loves. We're the people God hangs out with. We're the people that has been loved by God so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us on a cross at Calvary. He has saved us. He has healed us. He has set us free. And we don't know that yet, but we need to recognize it. <laughs> Glory to God. We are designated and designed to triumphantly and constantly demonstrate the reality of the kingdom of God. We tell ourselves, we become survivors and not conquerors. If I can just get through the day without depression, without somebody saying something bad about me, without being discouraged, then I feel like I've succeeded. That's not the way Jesus told us to live. We are more than conquerors. You are forgiven. You are set free. You are a child of God. Swing your feet under his table. Eat at his banquet table. Listen, it's time we recognize what Jesus did for us, what he paid for, and who we are. And when the devil comes to you and says, yeah, but look what you did, you can legally say, I didn't do that. You can say, that, that person that did that is dead. Think about that. I am dead with Christ. Crucified. I am done with him. It's over. When Moses asked God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? 
that I bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, I'm going to be with you. See, the question that Moses asked, the same question we have today, who am I? Who am I? Listen, here's who you are. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, there's part of the question, isn't it? You walking in the light today? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, all sin, continuously washing me clean. That's grace. I know it's uh, unmerited favor of God. Yeah, I, I know that. I know what grace is that. But I also believe favor and grace are different. I believe favor pushes open the doors before you that you couldn't push open. And when you make a mistake, I believe grace cleans up after you. Continuously, God is with you. He's before you and He's behind you. He's working all things together for good to them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, Father. We no longer think of ourselves. And don't think of yourselves as a dirty, rotten sinner. You're a child of God. You're saved. You're made clean. You were that, but you're not that any longer. You can tell the devil, the person you're talking to has never done what you've accused me of. I don't care if you've murdered 20 people. Well, I do care, but <laughs> don't bring your gun in here, okay? But whatever you've done, no matter how deep and dark the sin is, it's washed away. And you can say to the devil who's accusing you, you know, he's the accuser. He'll accuse you and say, look what you've done. God can never love you because of that. You were on drugs. You were an alcoholic. You, you, you beat your wife years ago. Uh, or your wife beat you. I don't know which it is. You know, in today's world it could be either one. But you tell the devil, you got the wrong guy. The person you're talking to never did that. That person is dead. He's gone. He's out of here. So you don't have to think about it anymore. See, we can't think of ourselves the way the devil wants us to think of us. We can't think of ourselves the way friends who know your past want you to think about yourself. You are free from that. God has set you free. Either the blood of Jesus is completely effective or it's not effective at all. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to what? Separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to God. That ought, that shout, you're not shouting like I'm preaching. I'm going to tell you something. Something's going wrong here. Hallelujah. That is worth a shout. Freedom. Don't let your past become your present identity. It's gone. Paul mentions here in, the, in these couple verses, he mentions the present and the future, but he never mentions the past. Think about it. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. I know where I am. You know, I tell you all the time, we don't live, we don't live in the past. We don't live in the future. Actually, we don't even live in the present. We live in the promise of God. That's our daily existence. God, what have you promised for me today? God, what is it that you have promised that you will do in my life today? How can I accomplish and experience and know what it is that you're doing? Don't let your past separate you from being aware that God loves you so much. There's no power, no circumstance, no person. There's no demonic reality or pressure or strategy of the devil. Nothing in existence right now can separate you from this love of Jesus. So rejoice, believer. We're not stuck in the past. You're not, you should rejoice again. You're not, let me say it. You are not stuck in your past experiences. I don't care what they are. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's how much he loves you. You're supernatural. Set free. God has given you his glory and presence and power. You're not stuck with your hurts or your pains or your illnesses or cancers of the body or mind or the attacks that the devil will bring to you. The good news of the gospel is we are transformed. We have a transformed supernatural mind. The mind of Jesus Christ that this mind that is in you be like Jesus. How many will take that? We're the sons and daughters of God. We need to begin to live like it, don't we? Change a few things in our life. I don't know if you're here today and you've been carrying a lot of guilt feel like in my spirit that there's some people here who just needs to get free today. 
because of what you've done or because of what someone else has done to you. Maybe there's some unforgiveness in your life. Maybe somebody's hurt you badly. I don't know. And maybe you need to forgive them. Whatever it is that you've been carrying too long, let's, let's let go of it today. Jesus went to a cross to take it off of you. He took our sins upon himself, the Bible says. And took them to a cross. And there he did away with them forever. That's the power of his blood. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray for these in this place today. I pray peace. God, I ask you that as we move through the rest of this few moments of the service, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in us that will set us free. But there have to be some people here today who struggle with the past. So, Lord, as we give it to you, I pray that you would take it completely, lift it from us so that we can walk in freedom, joy, and peace of God.